What's up everybody, Rob here. So, the Hawaiian Islands were home to some of the fiercest warriors in all of Polynesia. Their combat style revolved around the martial art of Lua, which is short for, and I'm going to mispronounce this, Kapu Kawailuna. Kawailua. You know, I'm just, it's on the screen, that's what it is. In any case, it means two hits. Now, the origins of Lua are somewhat of a mystery. Now, there is some speculation that is in some way related to the Hawaiian dance style of hula. But some people say that the movement patterns of hula um, are based on Lua. Some say that Lua is based on hula. Whichever one came first, I really don't know. That's way beyond the scope of my capabilities and the scope of this video. In any case, there is some connection. At least, there's believed to be some connection between the two. In any case, it's believed that early in... Um, Early in Hawaiian culture, there was very little conflict, as the Hawaiians did not have a war god early on in their history. Uh, they rather worshipped gods of healing and agriculture. This would change in somewhere between the 11th and the 13th centuries with the arrival of a Tahitian priest named Pao, uh, who completely restructured Hawaiian society. The nominally egalitarian Hawaiians were divided into the commoners and the nobility. There was also an introduction of the tapu system. Tapu is the root word of the word tabu, and it simply means forbidden. Um, basically, people of certain social classes were, it was kapu for people of certain social classes to perform certain actions. It was tabu, it was forbidden for them to do so. Um, and there was also the introduction of the Hawaiian war god, whose name I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce. Any case, as you can imagine, with the introduction of a war god, war warfare sprang up in Hawaiian society and conflict became commonplace. The various Hawaiian islands became their own petty kingdoms, and they continued to fight amongst one another until they reunited under King Kamehameha I, and yes, I'm able to pronounce that due to watching copious amounts of DBZ back when I was in high school. In any case, Hawaiian warriors were taught Lua, which was a formalized system of martial arts. In Lua, the students, called the Haumana, would learn from masters called the Alohe. They would be taught in a school called the Palua, the layout of which can vary greatly based on the tradition and the circumstances. However, the Palua was usually a walled-off area with only one entrance and was divided into three sections. Two training areas at the front and the rear of the Pa where practice would take place and a Kapu area uh, located in the center left in which the instructor observed. Only a select few would be allowed in this area as it required a certain degree of mana or power to enter. This area would be adorned with sacred plants and other ritualistic ornaments. Although practice of Lua was often restricted by social class, both men and women do, did train in Lua. And in times of war or emergency, commoners would be allowed to train in Lua, although generally it was reserved for the nobility. Because one of the main tenets of Lua involves a great variety of holds and grappling, the Lua practitioner would often coat themselves in coconut oil or, or some other type of oil in order to slip out of their opponent's grip. They would also remove their hair and the word alohe, which was the master of the of the palua, the you know a, a, an instructor. Um, the name means hairless. In addition to the martial art, the Lua school would also incorporate great deals of prayer and ritual. Uh, there were a lot of war chants. Uh, ways to psych people up. It's um, vaguely similar to the haka that was used by the Maori warriors in New Zealand. Uh, the same idea. They're not related, at least not, um, there's no direct connection between the two, but it is something of a point of reference uh, a lot of people would be familiar with. There is a great deal of similarity there. Um, way to intimidate your opponent, um, get yourself psyched up, get yourself in the zone, um, as well as put yourself in the right mindset for battle. Uh, this would be taught in addition to regular combat styles. Okay, now that we have, very briefly, the background and the basics of Lua taken care of, what does Lua itself actually consist of? Well, it's kind of hard to say. Now, there are many different styles and um, different interpretations of this. And also, you have to understand that this was a martial art that was passed down orally or through just, you know, a master would teach an apprentice, um, a student who would then teach another student who would then teach on and on and on down through the generations. It wasn't written down, at least not until um, Western missionaries showed up. And as you can imagine, they weren't exactly fond of, you know, traditional indigenous values. So um, for a time being after European contact, Lua was driven underground. And um, yeah, you can see that you can say that a great deal of information was lost. Now, what we do know is that Lua is generally based on Ai, which is basically something similar to a kata in modern-day karate. 
It's basically a specific form. Now there are many different Lua schools and each school would have their own versions of what each I meant. So there could be of the same technique at least 20 different variations and that's not an exaggeration. So there are some basic core principles that they all share, but each one's gonna have a slightly different take on what that particular technique looks like. Well, in any case, in general, Lua consists of a number of strikes, including punches and kicks, uh, using closed fists, um, open-handed slaps, um, strikes with both ridges of the hand, or both edges of the hand, so chops and, um, and the like, uh, using the tips of the fingers, uh, gouging with the fingers, or poking the eyes with the fingers, or something of that nature, as well as a great deal of grappling and um, wrestling type techniques. There are armed techniques using a various um, assortment of weaponry, which I'll get into a bit later, as well as fighting an armed opponent while one is unarmed, and occasionally the use of improvised weapons. For example, you see a rock, you pick it up, and you bash someone in the head with it. Overall, Lua is a complete martial art. It's for use in warfare as well as is, it is to be used in a self-defense context. So it needs to be as complete as possible. So again, like you have the strikes, you have the wrestling, you have weapons work, you have, you know, unarmed against the weapon. So in case, you know, you're on a battlefield and you lose your weapon or it breaks and it's unusable, you can improvise, you can use um, just found objects to protect yourself. Really, it's just supposed to be an all-encompassing, or it seems to me, to be an all-encompassing um, martial art. So the bulk of information that I've been getting about Lua has come from this book. It's Lua, Art of the Hawaiian Warrior by these individuals over here. And um, these people here were instrumental in preserving Lua as an art form. It was dying out. It was, um, well, yeah, it was dying out. There's really not much more to say. And uh, they helped uh, reinvigorate the art until it became what is known today. So all respect to them for that. So uh, if you're more interested in Lua in and of itself, um, you know, want a more in-depth than what you're getting here, uh, by all means, check this book out. It's absolutely fascinating, and um, just uh, remember to do so. So in any case, um, I would demonstrate these techniques. Let me just get to them. Um, I would demonstrate these techniques um, myself, except I'm here by myself, and Lua is, it seems to me, you'll see here, a lot of it involves... Uh, counter punching and really involves another person to be able to uh, uh, another person to be able to do properly therefore it's um, really not something I could do on my own so I'm just going to show it to you from the book here um, all right so you have uh, for example this one technique here it's that it means the blunted nose yeah that's, that's how you pronounce it well I don't know how you pronounce it but there you go all right so you got the Lua practitioner this guy here and um like we said before, lure practitioners would remove all the hair from their body. Yes, all these beautiful people. Uh, any case, so his opponent there, they square off against each other, and um, his opponent throws a punch at him, just um, just a standard cross. Now the lure practitioner here uh, uses his left hand to redirect or um, basically create an opening. He's pushing his opponent's uh, fist off the side while sidestepping as well, letting the fist go by him. Uh, thusly creating an opening and then boom counter-attacking or counter-striking with an uppercut right to the nose um, you could hit him in the jaw as well um, it says right here should be the nostril area or above the upper lip uh, then again in the this is all like you know very idealized in an actual combat environment you would pretty much hit whatever you can get your hands on or you know fist on in this case like whatever whatever you can get a hold of and um yeah, there you go. So that's it. It's again very counter punching type thing. Um, similar here. Um, there's another thing here. It's this technique. It's the pink nose variant one. There's multiple different variants. Again, your opponent they square off against each other. The Lua practitioner will throw, or the uh, the opponent will throw um, again a right hook or um, possibly even a straight punch. I guess it really doesn't matter. Uh, you bring your hand up into your opposite hand up, um, your right hand into a uh, an open hand strike, and then, hence the name, the pink nose. You whack him in the um, you just whack him in the nose. You whack him in the face with the open hand. Um, sort of like a kind of a combination of um, well, it says right here uh, strikes his opponent nose with the right edge of his palm. So basically the um, the blade. Uh, this particular part. You, you know what I'm talking about here. Uh, it's hard to hold a camera and point to things at the same time. 
any case, um, yeah, basically it's like almost like a horizontal karate chop type thing right to uh, your opponent's face. I guess you can also use a palm heel as well. I mean, whatever works for you. And that actually brings me to the next point. There's other variants. Like I said before, there are many variants of the same technique. This is the same technique again, but this time, it, you know, this time, if you'll notice here, um, the punch is kept at a higher level. Um, over here, the, the block pushes the arm downward, uh, making room making uh, leaving an opening for a strike to the face whereas in uh, the second variation the punch is kept high uh, you know the opponent's arm is kept at a higher point and then um, your arm doesn't go over the top but instead it goes underneath and you smash the nose that way so again it's the same principle same idea it's just a variant on a theme and that's just uh, something that if I you know there's there's actually four different variants here um, same thing again same punch Brought low again, and this is this is just a direct palm heel strike, um, straight to the face. Same idea, and this here, um, this is for kind of a wide arcing uh, punch. This is definitely for a hook or possibly an overhand right or something of that nature. It, same thing, and then uh, you block it high, you block it as far out. The, the opponent is now wide open, and then again a palm heel strike directly to the face. Uh, I guess you can do sort of an uppercut as well would also work in this particular um, in this particular circumstance. But again, it seems to be um, a lot of counter punching, letting your opponent make a move of some kind, and then um, exploiting that or um, pushing them off balance or uh, creating an opening and then exploiting it. I already got an interesting one here. This is um, this is the that the knife cut um, opponent strikes in with a um with again with a right hook or a right um possibly even a straight um yeah, probably a hook for this one would require be required um block or um stop the attack with um with your left arm the same side block it just keep the uh keep your opponent's fist from hitting you uh, again sidestep and then you would strike with the knife edge of your hand uh, again another like karate chop type thing um bridge hand strike you would do that right into the bicep and um, now I've done martial arts for many years I can you might say oh you're hitting him in the bicep that's not painful it's, it's extremely painful if you hit it right there it, it's painful just it's not it's not pleasant I could absolutely um, attest to that so it may not seem like a you know effective thing you, you always figure you know go for uh, the head punch the head don't punch the head you're more likely to break your fist than anything else but you know you, the head is a target the body's a target the groin is a target the eyes are a target you don't think like attack the opponent's arm but I can attest to you from personal experience it is exceedingly painful um, here's a variant of that same technique again um, again very similar opponent throws a punch it gets dropped downwards or uh, it gets blocked in a downward angle uh, with the opposite side of course this is um, if you're I guess you can say if the person is um, a bit farther away you can sidestep you can step back and then um, block with your opposite side hand so if they're attacking with your right you attack with your right as well so it's you know if you're facing each other it's the opposite and then um, you would uh, grab hold of the wrist with that hand to control the arm. And then you could, well, it's it says here you strike the bicep, but actually if from this position, you'd actually be striking at the tricep. I mean, the bicep just seems like a very difficult thing to get to. Um, this is actually very similar to a Hapkido technique. I did The martial I did was uh, Junki Hapkido. And um, this is something, uh, wrist break elbow, which is um, something we would do from many, many, many different techniques. And um, actually this could be used if you pull back with your right hand and then smash forward with your, um, well, it says here that you're you're chopping with your uh, with your hand, but if you use say your forearm while pulling back with your other hand at the same time, this will absolutely um, shatter a person's elbow. Uh, you can also do it to uh, drag the person to the ground or um, into a hunched over position, so you can control them without actually smashing their bones. Again, it depends on what your mood is. All right, we'll also have uh, this particular technique here, folded backwards. Opponent comes in, he throws a punch. You duck underneath, grab the elbow, or um, push under the arm, under the armpit, 
um, moving in, of course, uh, to close the distance, um, pushing the elbow offside and throwing your opponent off of balance, while at the same time then stick, putting your other arm at the small of his back, pushing in with the small, um, with your left arm on the small of his back and pushing up on the, uh, pushing up on the arm that's underneath his armpit and it will topple him over backwards. Um, there is again also a Hapkido technique very similar to this where, but instead of, um, um, pushing on the underside of the armpit, you would, uh, do a palm heel strike and push back on the person's chin, but same idea, similar idea. And like I said, uh, Lua has some grappling in it as well. You have this one here, strike upon the back, which mm, I don't know why they call that because you're not actually striking anything. It's, it's grappling, but, um, okay. Same idea. Opponent throws a punch, um, probably a hook or an overhand right again. Um, step in, duck underneath the punch, and um, from there, wrap your arm around this person's neck, or behind this person's neck, swing around behind him, and get him into a full Nelson. It's a pretty, pretty simple thing, but it doesn't stop there. Um, from right here, you could, well, it's side view, it's really the same thing. So, side view, and then once you're there, you can either snap his neck, or you can, well, here's where the striking comes in. Um, you can drive your knee into the person's tailbone, or also you can do a bunch of other things at this point. If you've got the guy in a full Nelson and really secured it in there, uh, you can easily, um, basically do whatever you want with the person. You can slam them, you can um, drive them unconscious, break their neck, um, hold them in. Mostly uh, the use of a full Nelson is, I mean, if you can get the um, break the neck, then, you know, by all means do it. Well, don't do it because that's like, that's called, you know, homicide and... You know, that's the way to become really popular with law enforcement. Um, but generally speaking, though, you have them at your mercy and you could um, hold them in place, though. If you're not doing damage yourself, hold them in place and then have your friend come up and then smash them right in the ribs as hard as he can. Um, just a thought. But anyway, so yeah, that's, uh, that's some grappling here. There's a lot more in here. Um, I could do this, you know, got some more just... I'm not going to go through... Yeah, of course, it's out of focus. We have some uh, more, like, you know, your opponent grabs you, um, you know, grappling type techniques, more striking, counter strikes, uh, some weapons forms, which I'll talk about the weapons in a few minutes, but uh, basically a lot of it is, um, you know, like this one here, you know, um, block this punch, um, you know, guy comes at you with a knife or um, some sort of a weapon. Again, same thing, you parry it across, similar way you do with a, a punch, and then you whack him in the face with a mace. Uh, again, same thing like, um, same thing as before, but with a, um, but with a weapon instead. And um, one of the more interesting techniques, you got this one here. The tripping cord, because that's exactly what it is, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. You'll see one of these things uh, in a little bit, but... Um, it's exactly what it sounds like. You swing this thing like a lasso. It goes around the person's legs. You trip his, you trip him. And then he's at your mercy. It's pretty... It, it's pretty obvious. I mean, it's... So, that's pretty much... Uh, it is exactly what it sounds like. And it does exactly what it sounds like. But yeah, there you go. So, very brief. Those are some Lua techniques. Again, the book is Lua, Art of the Hawaiian Warrior. Uh, those are the author's names right there. Uh, so by all means, check this out if you're more interested. And um, anyway, back to the video. Hawaiian warriors would often use various types of weaponry, both in warfare and in self-defense. Metalworking was not available on the Hawaiian Islands pre-European contact. So they may do with wooden weapons as well as stone and other types of natural materials that were readily available to them. This led to a number of ingenious devices for dispatching opponents. The wood that was used were a number of dense hardwood trees, which have long Latin names that I'm also not going to even attempt to pronounce. In any case, these are very dense hardwoods that will sink in water. So um, getting whacked with one of these things, it's not like a piece of plywood or something like that, like a little piece of lightweight pine. No, this is some pretty heavy stuff, and if it is in club form or some other form, it will absolutely, uh, absolutely do some damage. Now, the most popular weapon in Hawaiian warfare was a spear. Now, it came in three different distinct versions. You had a long spear, 
which is a very long spear, anywhere between 10 and 12 feet long. And the Hawaiian warriors in battle would stand shoulder to shoulder together, sort of like a Greek phalanx, and they would attack their enemy, you know, move in formation, very phalanx-like. Um, and once battle was joined, they would, you know, stab with the long spears, these 10 foot, 12 foot long spears, at which point um, the spears would either break or um, get embedded into their enemies' bodies, in which case it would switch over to a shorter spear, which was anywhere between four and six feet in length, sort of like a, um, a quarterstaff, but with the end fire-hardened. So, um, yeah, it's better suited for close quarter ranges. Also, there was a great deal of use of a third kind of spear. Basically, it's, it's a javelin. For use for throwing, it's one of the more popular ranged weapons. Hawaiian warriors would also use coconut fibers to make slings as another form of ranged weapon. Again, before battle would be joined, um, much like skirmishers, they would pepper the enemy with stones. And also slings are very lightweight and easy to carry, easy to conceal. Ammunition is readily available, given that, you know, stones, you're not exactly going to run out of those anytime soon. Really the same advantages in Europe or elsewhere with having a sling, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, now, once they got closer than the short spear range, the Hawaiian warriors would use a number of tools and weapons. Uh, what you see here is a stone club. It's simply a wooden handle with a rock tied onto it. Again, the handle is made from a very dense hardwood, and the um, the cloth or the rope lashings are usually made from coconut fiber, but really any sort of plant fiber will tend to do. Now, this is a stone-headed version. There are other versions as well, which are just basically one solid piece of wood. And here's just a solid piece of wood, and it would be used in very close quarters, you know, sort of like a European mace, similar idea. And if you look at those little white dots in there, those are human molars. I honestly don't know if these were given willingly or not. Um, you know, this is a prize of conquest or like how they acquired these molars, and honestly, I'd really rather not know. All right, what you see here is a very popular weapon amongst Hawaiian warriors, and it is a tripping cord or a tripping weapon. Um, the stones you see here would be attached to a long rope. One end of the rope would be held by the warrior, the other would be spun around his head, and it would then be launched at an opponent's foot. It would hopefully, if you do it right, wrap itself around the leg of the person you're, you know, you're trying to fight, and then at which point you could then yank the person off their feet, at which point you could then close the distance and bludgeon them to death with something else. Also, it stands to reason that instead of just being used solely as a tripping cord, this thing could be used sort of like a flail. Uh, basically, it's a weight attached to a rope. You can swing it around and bludgeon someone repeatedly at range with it. Um, I don't know any explicit examples of this happening, but I imagine that it would happen. I mean, it's... Come on, people. It's an obvious use. You have a weight tied to the end of a rope. Yeah, you can, like, swing it around and whack someone in the face with it. All right, and what you see here is probably the most unique weapon of the Hawaiian Islands. It is called the Leomano which means something along the lines of shark tooth weapon or shark tooth club because that's exactly what it is. It's basically a club or basically it looks like a you know tennis racket. It's about the same size as a tennis racket roughly and it is lined with shark's teeth. In this particular case it is lined with I believe those are tiger shark's teeth which are very very common in the waters off of Hawaii and um, just so you know you don't actually have to kill a tiger shark to get its teeth. Sharks shed their teeth all the time, finding them um, just like washed up on the beach is fairly commonplace. In any case, these, um, the shark's teeth would be attached to the weapon itself with, again, coconut fiber or some other sort of plant fiber, and it would become a pretty impressive ripping and slashing weapon. It's very similar to that, um, I, I forgot what it's called, but it's, it's an Aztec weapon where it's basically like, a, it looks like a cricket bat but with um, obsidian inserts in it. It's the same idea here, really. It's just, um, you know, you have this tennis racket shaped and sized thing here with the um, with the teeth, the tiger shark teeth along the outer edge. It's, you know, same idea. Also, if you look at the bottom of the weapon, at the base of the handle, you'll see it comes to a point, and that is a dagger edge. Uh, the bottom half of it could be used as a dagger to stab your opponent. So really, you have the front end for ripping and tearing into an opponent. And you have the bottom edge, which could be used to stab and to cut. The edges of that would be pretty sharp as well. Uh, more than useful as a, well, as a dagger or as a knife.
Now, generally, the Leo Mono was a single-handed weapon, though there is a two-handed version of this, which is basically a canoe paddle or a bow paddle that, well, has shark teeth along the edge of the blade of it. Sort of like a Hawaiian version of a Danax. Hawaiian warriors would walk into battle with some sort of rudimentary armor, something called a Waikawa. The name's on the screen. It is made of thick plant fibers that are woven together in sort of a mat and then worn over the body, sort of like a plant-based version of a gambeson. Now, while it's not nearly as effective as, say, metal would be, um, say, like chainmail or something like that, it would be pretty effective at cushioning blows. These are thick, heavy um, plant fibers that are being used and um, could absolutely, say, withstand an attack from, say, the Leomato. The shark's teeth would probably have difficulty ripping it or... Uh, going through the plant fibers and into the flesh beneath it. So it would provide a, a pretty decent deal of protection. Um, I wouldn't imagine it would uh, would do so well against bludgeoning weapons, but definitely against tearing weapons like the Leomano or um, the wooden knives that were used by the Hawaiian warriors. I can imagine it would be somewhat effective against that. Well, anyway, the Hawaiian warriors battled each other for many years each island becoming its own petty kingdom in the Hawaiian archipelago until they were united under King Kamehameha I, who basically had European firepower. By this point, the Europeans had um, made contact with the Hawaiians and they were more than happy to acquire muskets and other gunpowder type weaponry, which Kamehameha used to very devastating effect, uniting the Hawaiian islands under his rule. The art of Lua was eventually suppressed with the coming of Christian missionaries in the 1820s and 30s, who, like I said before, don't really take kindly to indigenous practices, and the art was driven underground, and was almost extinct until its revival in the late 20th century. Lua is still practiced today, both as a martial art form and also as a way of preserving Hawaii's indigenous culture. So that's it for the video, just a very brief overview of what Lua is. I was in Hawaii a couple of years ago and I just discovered this and I figured I'd make a video about it. So, um, so there you go. Hit the like and subscribe button, more videos will be coming out whenever I get around to it. And that's pretty much it. Right, have a good day. Or don't, you're adults, have any kind of day you want. See ya.